Hello, biology team. It is Mrs. Graham and Mr. Toda, and we are here to tell you a little bit more about evolution. And specifically today, we want to talk a bit more about the evidence for evolution, and then we wanted to get into some more details on adaptations. You can see your key terms are listed there. Now, we're going to look at, as I said, the evidence behind evolution. And remember, we are looking at evolution from a scientific point of view. So we are looking at the theory of natural selection and the evidence for that theory. Um, obviously, there's lots of other different beliefs out there on evolution, depending on religion, faith, etc. Perfectly welcome to those beliefs. But since this is science, we are going to look at everything from a scientific point of view. So our first piece of evidence for evolution is the idea of biogeology. So the study of where organisms lived and where their organisms in the past have lived. And we can look at our fossil record that is strong evidence for this idea of biogeology. And Darwin also made two important discoveries um, in terms of looking at biogeology. And he determined that closely related organisms that live in different environments are going to have different environmental pressures on them and they're gonna show differences. Whereas things that are not closely related, we call that distantly, distantly related organisms that now live in similar environments are often going to be similar. So again, living in these different environments, um, they're gonna have those pressures of natural selection upon them. So they found birds that live all over the world that never really evolved from similar organisms that are in fact, similar to each other because they're living in these similar environments and facing similar pressures from the environment. All right, our second piece of evidence for evolution comes from the study of embryology. And embryology right, is the study of development of a fetus in the case of humans, right? Or uh, organisms after they're uh, fertilized, right? And grow through their adult stage. So. Uh, and the, the cool thing about embryology, right, is looking at, and you can see here is a picture of a couple different organisms, right? Shark, lizard, chicken, pig, and human, is that when we are developing, right, before we're born, the embryos, right, actually look pretty similar. And you can see uh, we actually have some, like, gills here. We all got tails. We all got eyeballs and heads, right? And it's only after a significant amount of time uh, develop of developing uh, that we see that you actually start to see some differences, right? This starts to look like a human, a pig, a bird, so on and so forth. So the study of embryology, right, uh, really shows how we are all related and that we, we develop very similarly at the beginning, and then we start to differentiate as we grow into adulthood. And it's really cool because back uh, before we knew how this was all related, early scientists actually thought that humans, right, would go through different stages where you went from a shark, to a lizard, to a chicken, to a pig, to a monkey, right? Now we know that's not entirely true. But uh, again, they were going based on the fact that so many of these embryos look, look so similar, right, while they're developing into adulthood. So embryology is the second piece of evidence. So the third piece of evidence for evolution are called homologous body structures. And we, we see that prefix homo a lot in biology. We saw it for uh, homozygous versus heterozygous. So homo means same and homologous structures are same or similar structures found in one organism to another. And um, in a lot of organisms, one of those homologous structure is their bones. So the bones that make up the arm of humans and the wing of certain birds and the flippers of something like a whale, the fins or flippers, whatever you want to call them, of a whale, all have very similar bone structure. And one of the activities you're going to do um, in class this week as look at these bones in these different organisms and see how they are, even though they've developed and evolved to have these very different functions, come from very similar structures. So again, that prefix homo means similar or same, and we call those structures homologous structures, our third piece of evidence for evolution. 
All right. So our next piece is, uh, you know, after homologous structures where we have, you know, similar structured organs, right, or body structures, we have these things called vestigial structures, okay? And a vestigial structure is where uh, it's an organ that had a previous function, but it's left over, right? Now we don't use it for anything. And th this is seen in all types of organisms. And in humans, right, we could think of a couple different ones, all right? The first one is your appendix. And maybe you know somebody who had their appendix taken out. They had appendicitis, all right? Well, our appendix is this little doodad that hangs off the bottom of our colon there, our large intestine. And uh, we don't use it anymore, all right? And it actually used to be used for hundreds of thousands of years ago when early uh, human-like ancestors of ours, not humans per se, used to eat a lot of uh, kind of twigs and smaller plants and branches like that. It helped break down the cellulose, the complex sugar uh, that kind of makes up like tree bark, all right? And it helped with that. But as humans evolved or pre-humans evolved into humans, right, and we started growing more uh, healthier, nutrient-rich foods and eating meat more and hunting and fishing and all that type of stuff, we didn't really need the, uh, the appendix anymore to help break down those really complex, like woody, barky type structures. So our function of the appendix went away, but it's still in there, all right? So don't go home and try eating some tree bark off the tree outside. That's not going to work out too well. But uh, the appendix, though, even though it doesn't function anymore, it's still there. So what can actually happen sometimes is if you have appendicitis, right, you get a little piece of, of food or digestive material that gets in there, you get infected, and it swells up and very painful, and it can pop gross. Um, another vestigial organ, right, would be on our arms, right, maybe when it's really cold or you get scared out, uh, scared, something like that, you get goosebumps, right? And your hair sticks up, all right? Well, that, that's a vestigial function, right, from our, our mammal ancestors. When it's really cold or they get really worked up, their hair stands straight up in the air. And a couple things, right, it helps trap like a nice warm blanket of air over them. So if you ever see a deer or a dog or a coyote or a fox, right, running around outside in the winter, their hair's gonna be all puffy and keep them warm. Maybe you have a dog or a cat at home too, and they get really excited or nervous or afraid. Same thing, their hair sticks up, and uh, that's a vestigial function. So again, vestigial functions, and there's plenty of other ones in the body too that we'll talk about in class, are ones that we do not longer use, but they're still present in us. The final piece of evidence for evolution is our molecular evidence. And what we're talking about here is DNA. And this has kind of sealed the deal on uh, natural selection. Now that scientists can look at the different genomes of different organisms and study all these different organisms on the molecular level or the DNA level, we're starting to see uh, that organisms that have evolved from the same ancestors share similar DNA. And in fact, some organisms that scientists used to group together and think were highly related, now that we have this molecular evidence, we're finding they're not, in fact, very similar on the molecular level at all. So it's really changed the study of evolution, our evolutionary tree, how we are grouping different organisms together in terms of common ancestors. And it's just really providing this strong evidence um, when an organism shares a lot of DNA with another organism that they evolved from a common ancestor. So all of this molecular evidence in terms of the DNA has provided a lot of evidence for, the, for our ideas of evolutions and our theories of natural selection. So our last big kind of solidifying piece of evidence is that DNA. Yeah, and talking about DNA evidence, right, and there's plenty of examples that we'll talk about up there, but you see three birds on the, the bottom of the page here, okay? These are, um, th this is a vulture, right? This is another type of bird, or sorry, this is a vulture. This is another type of bird here, and you might think if you look at them, right, these guys definitely look more related, okay? And this one over here is a stork. Maybe you've heard of storks before. They drop babies off on your doorstep in the middle of the night. But um, you would think these guys are related, right, more closely. This bird, which is a type of like eagle and, and a stork here, uh, sorry, the vulture. But if you were to look at the DNA sequence of all three, you would actually see that this vulture is more closely related to the stork than it is to this guy. So it just goes to show that looks aren't everything, and sometimes it depends on the DNA to really see how closely related uh, two or three organisms are. All right, so, uh, and this kind of brings us to this idea of adaptations, right, which help uh, or help organisms in that process of natural selection, right, giving them a high fitness. 
And some of you guys have talked about this already, but it's an inherited characteristic that increases an organism's ability to survive and reproduce in a specific environment. So I'm sure already we've looked at some adaptations, right? Kind of like advantages that, or of these characteristics that organisms can inherit. All right, so I mean, here's just a whole bunch of them right here, some of our favorites, right? Giraffes obviously have nice long necks to reach the, the best leaves at the top of the tree, right? It gives them an advantage to live longer, eat more, and reproduce. Um, you know, looking at a hummingbird, right? How it can get the nectar from different flowers by being so light and fast, right? That's an adaptation that other heavy birds couldn't have. Um, another one of my favorites here, right? The cuttlefish, okay? It's kind of related to the squid and octopus mollusk uh, family there and really cool stuff. Maybe you've seen some videos already in class how they can change colors and they can camouflage. They can change their skin texture to look bumpy or smooth. And they can even use their color changing abilities to hypnotize crab. It's pretty sweet. So there's all types of organisms out there with adaptations, right? And one great example, and you might think, well, this is not an adaptation, right? Imagine seeing a polar bear, right, in a nice green forest like this. Well, we know polar bears live in the Arctic, right, where it's white, uh, and their adaptation is their white fur, right, the camouflage that helps them blend in. And that's where, where polar bears came from, right, is the early ancestors of polar bears had a mutation from brown bears that gave them white fur. And we saw those two groups of bears split off and start to develop separately. So think about it. If I were to put a polar bear in the rainforest here, uh, he would stick out like a sore thumb, right? Predator, or prey would see him coming from really far away. There's no way he'd be able to sneak up on anybody in the rainforest and eat them. So that's an example of not an adaptation, right? It would not help him survive and reproduce. So we can break adaptations down into some different categories. And the first category we'll talk about is morphological or anatomical adaptations. These are the adaptations you can look at and see on an organism. So they have to do with different body structures. So one of the common ones you probably know is camouflage. So when an organism camouflages into its habitat, into its background, so it cannot be easily found by its its predators. Um, mimicry, which is when an organism kind of looks like another maybe more poisonous organism. And different defense mechanisms. A lot of plants have different um, morphological defense mechanism adaptations, like the spikes on a cactus would be another example. So think of the morphological Adaptations is the ones that are kind of the body structures, the ones you can look at and see, like the long neck on the giraffe that Mr. Tota just talked about in the previous slide. So those are your morphological adaptations. All right, so another category of adaptations, we talked about the anatomical, the actual structure, right? The physiological, so how do, how do animals and plants use some of those structures, all right? And a lot of these have to do with cellular features and internal changes, right? Things that organisms can use, right, as an adaptation in the way they live their life, all right? And there's some really cool couple examples here. We obviously all know uh, Mike, 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 what day is it? Hump day. Hump day, right? But a camel has a hump, right? And what is that hump for? Well, it's not actually a big giant water reservoir, right? Because we know camels need an adaptation to help them survive in the desert, right? What that actually is, is a fat reserve, which they can actually use to help them with retaining water and, and being able to survive in that really dry climate where they may not get water all the time. All right, another uh, great physiological adaptation uh, would be these lizards here, which actually have blood uh, vessels in their eyes that when somebody comes in to eat them or attack them, they can actually squirt blood out of the corner of their eye uh, and cover their predator in it so that it gets uh, all over them and kind of freaks them out, right? Like, why is this guy shooting blood at me from his eyes? So like a self-defense mechanism. And again, uh, right, another great example here would be a rattlesnake, right? Not only do they develop this rattle, right, which uh, if you if you ever heard a rattlesnake, right, it's got that tss, rattling sound so that if you're walking near it, right, it's kind of a warning symbol to like, hey, stay away because I'm going to bite you. I'm rattling. And uh, then if you get close enough, right, they'll, they'll bite you and they, they are venomous. So some physiological adaptations. Oh yeah, and they're cold-blooded too, right? So they, uh, you know, they can't regulate their body temperature like we do. So that's why you see reptiles 
need to go out and sun themselves and lay out in the sun, whether it's alligators or crocodiles and just living that dream, soaking up the suntan, right? That's an adaptation to help them use the environment, right, to their uh, advantage. And then our final category of adaptations are behavioral adaptations. Now, I know you're thinking a lot of behaviors are learned. And when we're talking about a behavioral adaptation, we're talking about something that is innate to the organism. It's nothing they need to learn. So for example, a great example for around here is birds. Birds migrate south for the summer. It's not like they get together and, you, and say, you know what, Bob, it's really cold here in Boston. Well, let's go down to Florida for the summer. No, it's behavioral. It is an adaptation. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to learn it. They just do it, okay? It's in their DNA. Hibernation, like some bears and other animals do in the winter, another behavioral adaptation. Um, tool use, is an adaptation. Sexual selection, you'll look at some videos in class this week of different mating habits of different organisms, different behavior, different dances they perform to attract mates. Those are all behavioral adaptations. And again, an adaptation is inherited. It is in the DNA. So these are different from learned behaviors. Like we learn how to read and walk and write. Those are all learned behaviors. When we're talking about behavioral adaptations, it's inherited. It's in the DNA. So those are your three types of adaptations, morphological or anatomical. Those are your body structures, um, your physiological, which are your internal processes, and then your inherited behavior. So we hope that gives you a little more evidence and explanation for evolution and an explanation of those different types of adaptations. Have a great day.